So good evening everybody and uh, a very, very big welcome and um, without further ado, let's just welcome the wonderful, the marvellous, the unpredictable sometimes, uh, the big influencer, the most wonderful actor that I've seen on television and film, he's absolutely brilliant. Please welcome Mr. Steve Evans. Good evening. Hello everyone. Steve, how Hi. are you? <laughs> Trevor, lovely to see you again, mate. <laughs> how are you, Steve? I'm all right, but before we start, Yes. My daughter's in the bedroom watching the Cardassian, so hang on. Turn that Cardassian shit down, or I'll smash your fucking telly up again. Okay. You just told me to fuck off. That's, that's oh, it. right. Okay. Well, that was a, that was a polite way to start the evening. <laughs> so there we are. So how are we? Have we been influencing today? Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, it, none of it works, though, thankfully. Mm. Anybody who expects something for nothing because we've got a load of fucking people following what's shooting, in my opinion. Right, right. Okay. So, there you go. <laughs> That's a lot. Okay, I think we'll end it then. <laughs> well, you know, the nerve of these people, the nerve of these people. <laughs> I can influence what people think of your business. Can I have something? Go yeah. away, please. Apart from yesterday when you received, what was it, some, some uh, squidgy sweet or something? Um, yeah, I got plenty chew. A, pe a penny chew, wow. Well, that was generous of them, wasn't it? Well, I told him to stick it, it wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, well, look, um, I'm going to kick off with this because, honestly, to goodness, you've got, I mean, what a fantastic career you, 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 you're having. It's absolutely amazing. But I want to go right back, if I may, Steve, um, to, uh, yeah, first of all, you were born in Salford, and I'd like you to tell us, uh, for those that don't know, um, what happened um, before all of this started in, in your career? You know, from, from being in the Merchant Navy to your time in Bombay, if you'd like to give us a little well, idea. It was, I'm, I'm just a typical Irish Catholic, uh, from an Irish Catholic family. Right. <coughs> Mum and dad, six kids, uh, frog march to church on Sunday. You know, quite disciplinarians, the parents. Um, and uh, my mum had this amazing spy network. You know, you could get on a bus, go to East Disbury and smoke a cigarette. By the time you got home, she knew. So, you know, you're always getting a crack for doing something out of order. So it was just a normal upbringing in Salford. Yeah. Went to school, left school, didn't have a clue. Last day at school, this bloke came in and showed us some film of uh, the Merchant Navy blokes on freight ships going around the world. And I thought that was for me. Mm. This was the last day at school. So instead of getting the bus home, I got the bus the other way down to the docks. I went into shipping federation. I was 15 mm -hmm. and I said, I'd like to join. And he said, well, you've got to be 16. So I said, I'm 16 next week. <laughs> so he said, well, fuck off and come back next week. So I did. I came back the next week and uh, he went, oh, you again. I, I had to do a medical. I was all right. I was 16, 16 now. Yeah. That's that. <laughs> Done a written exam. Next thing, I'm in sea school for three months down in Gravesend in Kent, wearing a uniform and saluting and learning rope work, wire work, lifeboat skills, steering ships, compass, all that nonsense. Yeah. And then on the last day there, an officer said to us, everything we've taught you, forget about it, because it's all bullshit. <laughs> You're going to go on ships where it's different. So I basically, I worked on freight ships. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, worked my way around the world, really. Which for me, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do in the arts. I just knew that a nine to five wasn't for me. I, I, I knew even at that early age that having a job I didn't like to spend money on stuff that I didn't need in order to keep the job that I didn't like mm. was the biggest catch 22 that I, I knew I didn't want any part of it. Mm. I've done a, a, a comedy sketch at school with an English teacher that she enjoyed so much. She asked us to show it to the whole school. Um, assembly yeah uh, no that's kind of like the first time i got applause and thought whoa this is uh, really weird and it was quite a powerful thing but i was never encouraged to to do anything in the arts because i didn't go to that kind of school it was a real salford nuts and bolts when you leave you get the job to pay your way to buy your house to breed your kids yeah and that was it and th th there was no expectation in, in, in the weirdest world that you could actually earn something within the arts whatever section mm. so it's pretty much a trial and error for me 
I was in the Merchant Navy for about three years and I eventually got kicked out. I then got a job delivering industrial pipes. Uh, I knew, met a girl I'd known for years, we got married, um, got divorced, lost the job, was on the dole, done a foundation course at Abram Moss. Mm -hmm. I only wanted to do drama. I knew now I wanted to do drama. This was in the early 80s, early 80, 82, 83, or something like that. Yeah. But uh, uh, so I went to Abram Moss, but I had to do three other subjects with drama. I just wanted to do drama. Yeah. But you had to do maths and English, they were compulsory. Mm -hmm. So you could choose two subjects. Mine was drama, the other one I just picked this day. But I didn't go to the other subjects, I just went to drama. Yeah. Because that's all that I wanted to do, but it wasn't enough. Anyway, I got kicked out of there because I wasn't going to the other three subjects. <laughs> but then the Helen Parrott, who's the, she's well known now, she was a drama teacher there. She came to my flat when I lived in Crumsall because they'd started a new course there called the Practical Drama Course. Right. Where you, you had to audition to get on the scheme. Yeah. So there was about 12 of us who auditioned for it, got picked. We were given a budget to do three productions a year. This was what I, this was my lifeblood. Yeah. We had a van, we had a trailer, we had to do our own scenery, make our own costume or source it from charity shops. Um, we had a budget, do our advertising, we had to devise the three shows mm -hmm. right across the spectrum from uh, little kids, a show for little kids, a panto kind of thing, one for teenagers ready to leave school, and one for old people in care homes. So we catered each production specifically for that group. Yeah. We wrote it, we rehearsed it, we got tight, we were good. And uh, that for me was one of the best times. We were in this old van, we booked the tour, we were out touring with it after we devised it and wrote it. And that's where I kind of really broke my teeth yeah. on the disciplines needed in the industry. And it was an unforgettable time for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I'll never forget Helen Parry for seeking me out to let me know that that course existed. I love that I'm much yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. that. So what happened after that then, Steve? So you were doing that, you were touring around with these people. Um, what was the kind of, did you have in mind the next kind of step where you would like to, something you would like to move on to from that? Yeah, well, the, the, the thing then was equity was a closed shop. Yeah. So you had to have a, a, an equity card to do professional work, but you had to have done professional work to yeah. get the equity card. So again, we were in the Cats 22. So we decided to blag it. So after we'd left Abram Moss, me and two other people, uh, a male and female friend, we formed a street theatre company called Snacks from Outer Space. Right. We were doing street theatre on, on uh, Market Street. I mean, one of the things we did, <clears throat> we had scarves with wire in, so it looked like they were blowing in the wind. And we could get bread and throw it on the floor. And when all the pigeons landed, do yeah. a version of Al Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and then we'd run around with a hat and collect money. I'm so sure. that's what we were doing. Yeah. But then it was to get an equity card. To, 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 we had to have four past contracts, four present ones and four yeah. future ones. Yeah. We yeah. simply went to four landlords of pubs and said will you say that we played at your pub and they said uh, yeah so we got the contract signed yeah we got four future bookings that we were going to honor and four present uh -huh. ones so we basically plugged it so now we got the equity cards yeah so then we dipped our toe into the world of television Right. And of course, it was extra work, and, and I'd done extra work in, in Brookside, I'd done it in, um, in Coronation Street, and 101 other productions. Yeah, yeah. But it, it was one <laughs> production of Dennis Waterman, was it? I don't know what it was. And the unit car came with the actor on it. Obviously, this actor's last day. The unit car pulled up, the lad done his scene. I didn't bear in mind, we'd been sat in a room for 12 hours. But this lad pulled, turned up, he'd done his last scene, mm -hmm. the crew all applauded him, he got back yeah. in the unit car and he went. Oh. He was in one in an hour. Yeah. And I said to my mate, we should be the bloke in the car. Yeah. Not the bloke in the room waiting for 12 hours. Exactly. So then I made a conscious decision that, which wasn't easy because I was on benefits at the time, mm. I was divorced. 
there's all sorts of shit going on with him. Uh, can't tell you. <laughs> yeah, but, um, so I made a conscious decision not to do any other extra work, even though it was kind of my only source of income apart from benefits. Mm -hmm. That was a tough move to make. Yeah, but I, yeah. I did realise that nobody would kind of, unfortunately, take you seriously if you put down that you've done extra work on your CV. No, because that we're doing extra work, of course, with the greatest of respect to anybody that does extra work. Some people will, will carve a career out in doing that. I know, mm. and that's great. But if you really have that kind of ambition to do something else and you really want to take yourself to that next level for you, for, for you to be seen, to be known, yeah. you've got to move out of that, haven't you? Absolutely. I, I mean, I knew then I wanted to do lines, I wanted to do characters, I wanted to yeah. do all that. Yeah, but yeah. I didn't really know how to go about it. So I, I started, uh, well, joined the Actors Centre. I spent many hours in the Actors Centre. I used to jump the train to get down there because I had yeah. no money. Mm. I mean, I got done for shoplifting food. That's how, how bad things were. Yeah, yeah. I got done in Sainsbury's for nicking food. The bastards wanted to, to me to confess to a lot of other crimes that I didn't do. I told them to stick it now. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so the next thing then was to learn audition pieces. Yeah. And, and I, I read somewhere that you needed to know a Shakespeare piece and a, a contemporary piece. Yeah. I learned um, a, a monologue from uh, Cymbeline, I think it was. Yeah. And I learned a Stephen Burkhoff contemporary one. Mm -hmm. So I was at the Actors Centre on the notice board and I was going for all these theatre companies. It was all profit share. That means you got no money. Mm. That wasn't important to me at this point. What was important to me was experience. Yes. Uh, doing plays with other actors. And of course, plays is different because it, from TV, where TV you're all over the place chron chronologically. Yeah. The beautiful thing about a piece of theatre is it starts and it ends chronologically. Mm. So it was great to learn all that and knowing marks and cues. And it was an invaluable few years. And I think I must have worked with every fringe theatre group in Manchester. I worked with Old Six One, yeah. uh, Penny found in Penny Black, the contact theatre. You know, I, I've done all the Chuck Buxton Festival, we were there. Uh, Skull in Connemara, we did outdoors where we actually dug the grave. Um, you know, it was real, real. Real stuff. Craft. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. So, uh, once you'd, you'd, you'd done all of that, um, what was the first kind of break in, in, in television for you? Right, well, after that, then what I needed then was an agent. Right. So uh, I looked into it and found out about actors cooperatives. Okay. Actors cooperatives are exactly what they say. They're a cooperative run by actors. So you're your mm. own agent in a way. Mm. But that's a great thing because it gives you a peep into the business and you can get your foot in the door and you're privy to the casting information. However, the downside is it's mm. actors running it. And actors are very, very funny uh, people but the actors court was great for me mm. but again that was going down the corporate video path right i didn't want to go down that you earned a good living at it mm. but it wasn't for me i was with one actors cooperative and then they asked me to leave because i wasn't doing the office days i hated being in that kid office <laughs> but it was always meetings about the same time who's not put a cup back in in, in the cupboard Who's not put a pen back in the drawer? Oh, so, you know, you, you were there once a month on a Sunday, like with a hangover, listening about <laughs> someone who's not, not took a tea bag off the fucking sink. It, it wasn't for me. So I ended up going with um, <coughs> a different um, direct personal management, Leeds Daphne Franks. Right. They to see you performing. They came and see me in a production. I think it was at Buxton Festival at the time doing a play. Mm. They okayed me. I joined their. Actors co op and started getting a little bit bits of work. Yeah. I mean, what one job? It was great because I got the unit car picked me up. I had a scene to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, <laughs> when it was on TV, the scene, it was completely cut out. Oh. I wasn't in it at all, you know. Yeah, so that yeah. was like, oh, right. Oh, okay. That's how it works, is it? <laughs> so you've, got to, you've got to take these like kicks in the teeth and yeah, you yeah, to yeah, your yeah. advantage you really have got to be yes, like yes yeah, yeah. One of these kung fu guys and if you see trouble coming towards you 
just gently step out of the way and let it go past. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Pick yeah. up where you left off. Yeah. So, so that was it. I was with Actors Cooperatives and, okay. and that for me instead, good stead. Yes, and so um, did you? How long did you? How long did you stay with the um, these cooperatives then, Steve? Before well, you? Well, the first one I wasn't there very long because uh, I wasn't doing the office days. And right. Yeah. Anyway, the second one, I was there a few years. I was getting decent parts. Yeah. Uh, well, starting to, starting yeah. to get trusted with like bigger little bits and bigger mm. bits. And then I stopped doing my days in the office there because it used to do me Sweden. Just yeah. going in, I didn't want to work in an office. Mm. Uh, but Daphne Frank, she fought my corner. And again, I salute Helen Parry. Thank you, Helen, for having faith in there. And Daphne Frank, thank mm. you for defending my corner. Mm. You were having these meetings and you're going, he's not here again. He never does his office days. He doesn't even come to the meetings anymore. But get rid of him. And Daphne was like, but he's bringing money into the agents there. Mm. And that's what keeps the agency going. Yes. Uh, yes. But then the audition for uh, the Ken Loach film came in. Right, right. And that kind of like changed things a little bit as well. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Oh, Trevor was in that as well. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah. Like, did you both work together on the same scene? Or? Oh, me and Trevor go way back, way back. I was doing uh, stupid poetry and, and Trevor was getting me gigs. He was representing me at one point, getting me. Oh, is that off chip, man? Do you help? Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, I've just been looking at that. Yeah. So <laughs> um, you mentioned the Ken Loach film. Um, I mean, would you like to tell us a little bit about? How that all came about. I mean, I mean, working with yeah. Loach is fantastic. I mean, brilliant. Yeah. Um, well, it was a very, very simple brief. It was. It came into the agency. Ken Loach is making a film. He's looking for males aged between forty and fifty. I think the forty and fifty-five. I think that's what the brief. That was it. Yeah. So Daphne just threw my name in the hat because I was male. I was northern, and I was in that age bracket. So that was that. Yeah, and I'd always been a big fan of Ken's, and mm. yeah, I went, I met him, and it was all very like, yeah, do a little bit of improv, and then it was like, okay, thank you, we'll be in touch, and then you left the room, and you hear nothing mm -hmm. for a week, maybe two weeks, mm. and then I did say, oh, he wants to see you again, so you go back, he does more improvisation. Maybe this time a little longer, a little bit more intense, a little bit more complex. Yeah. And then it, thank you, we'll be in touch. And then you, you hear nothing for two weeks. Mm. I got nine callbacks for Ken Loach, nine. And each time it was improvisation with larger groups. Mm -hmm. I'm sure me and Trent done one together at some point along the yeah. way. Because Ken was always mixing and matching. And, and then he'd, he'd get somewhere over the side and he he'd whisper something to them and they'd go back in the improv and he'd throw you a curved ball and completely turn everything on its head so it went in a different direction. And he does that to see how you cope with things, to see if you stay in character, to see yeah. if you put your guard. Yeah. Because yeah. when he does it on set, because when you get the job, yeah. like I got the job, luckily, as the lead role in Looking for Eric. Now, you don't see a script. Ken won't let you see a script. He shoots in chronological order on right. black and white, 35, well, 35 milli film, all razor cuts. But on day one, you're doing scene one. And then scene two comes straight after scene one. Yeah. And then scene three. You don't do scene 70 on the first day and then do scene one on the... It doesn't work like that with Ken because he doesn't let you see the script. He yeah. drip fetches you the scenes the day before. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're doing tomorrow. So you don't know anything about how your character's going to turn out. You don't know if your character's going to die, mm. or if it's going to come good or bad. You don't know anything about your character's future. Yeah. You, know everything, you know everything about his past because mm -hmm. you've done loads of improvisation about it. Yeah. You know everything about the present because you're living it now yeah. on film every day. I mean, there was a collation, but you know nothing about how it's going to turn out. <laughs> it was an interesting way of uh, working for me. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I mean, that's, that's brilliant with, with Ken Loach, I suppose. I mean, I've never worked with him, but 
uh, it's that's that's life, isn't it? You know, and the way he does that is sounds brilliant because you know, like you say, you don't know if your character's going to die. So you know, and we we all know we're going to die eventually, but we don't know when. So that makes it all the more real, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> but what he uses that for then is he lulls you into this whole sense of security. Right. Like he gave me this scene where I mean, I didn't know Eric Cantona was going to be in the film. I, I didn't have a clue. Mm. I knew my character was a fan of Eric Cantona's. Mm -hmm. I've done loads of research on Eric, but I didn't know he was going to be. And I had this scene where my character was speaking to a poster of Cantona. My character turns his collar up, have a Cantona, and speaks, has a spliff. Yeah. We've done that scene, and it was right. Cut. Ken says, We'll do one more. So you do another. Cut. We'll do another. Cut. Yes, yes, we'll do one more. He also says one more. <laughs> one more, one more. So you do one more. Now I've done seven takes of this scene. Yeah. And I say, Ken, what am I doing wrong, Ken? What, it, what, what? He says, no, it's not you, it's the lights. We need to tweak the lights. Go outside, have a cigarette, and tweak the lights. I'll go outside, have a cigarette. I come back, they put these flats up, these black flats. Yeah. He says, we will do one more. So I do one more and I speak to the poster like I've done eight times. And now a voice behind me says, well, have you? And I turn around and it's Eric Cantona. Oh. And he catches it on film. So you, you don't know. And this is why all this improv pays off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can't suddenly come out and go, Ken, what? You never told me he was in it. Uh, you've got to just stay there in the yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, it, it's an incredible way of uh, working. And how did you feel with meeting your, your football idol? I mean, seeing him, what was that? It was just an incredible experience. I can't explain. It felt like I'd uh, taken a, a, a shitload of acid or something. <laughs> and now I'll never forget the feeling that I turned round and I knew something wasn't right. Yeah. And then when I turned round and Eric Cantona was like, stood five feet away from there and he was in the film <laughs> and the camera was right on my face to get yeah. the reaction. Yeah. I mean, I think I said something like, is it really you? <laughs> and you know, yeah, and I said to him, we'll say something in French then. Je suis à Cantona. And then he was like, right, lunch. He was like, whoa, hang on a minute, you can't do this. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant. It's an unbelievable, and next thing I was having my lunch sat next to uh, yeah. Cantona, like shaking my head. <laughs> What's going on here? So that was, and then of course you were nominated, weren't you, for best actor on this? Yeah, I was, uh, well, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't win, but yeah, I got nominated for, uh, I think it was, at, yeah, it was at the European Film Awards. He flew me out there and put me in a fucking tuxedo and all that bollocks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was okay. <laughs> it was a good laugh. Yeah, but I mean, even just to be nominated, I mean, that is, yeah. tough, isn't it? Yeah, well, it was, it was, it was because I'm not, I didn't understand all that part of it. It's right. me. It's about being on set, you know, and, and yeah, seeing the yeah, end result. Doing the job. What yeah. Everyone's done together. It's just yeah, lovely. Yeah. If I may move on, I mean, I'd love to yes. talk about this for, for hours. I mean, I'm sure everybody would love to hear more about it. Oh, I will ask you this. Do you still keep in touch with Eric Cantona? Does he, does he keep Well, uh, last time, I, I have his phone number, but I wouldn't dream of ringing him or texting him. I wouldn't do that. He's probably changed it by now. But when he did... Uh, he did an evening at the Lowry, I think it was. Okay. Yeah, I got in touch with him now, and he sorted me out with some tickets with a couple of mates of mine, and we went down, and we had yeah, a yeah, yeah. afterwards. Oh, that, what, what, what a fantastic memory. I mean, you know. And it's yeah, a, incredible. You know, you'll never, ever, ever forget that, you know. Uh, I'm going to move on a little bit. There's a couple of things here. One, um, which a film I remember from, I think, from the 19... 40s or 50s obviously you weren't in that version of it and that was <laughs> Brighton Rock oh yeah yeah Brighton um, Rock with Nicky Attenborough was Richard Attenborough wasn't it in the original right. who did you you were somebody called Mr Wilson can you remember much about that or what, what yeah was I can it was uh, the remake of Brighton Rock obviously and I was the played the father of um the girl in it who Pinky Pinky manipulates and uh, yes. takes a kind of charge off I forget her name. Right. Um, I can't but, remember. Yeah, I, was, I only had, I think I had two scenes in it, but it were really yeah. nice scenes, and it was nice <laughs> to be a part of that production. Yeah, I basically sold my daughter to Pinky for a few quid. Yeah. 
and then um, you were then you played a persa in Pirates of the Caribbean. Right now, this is where it gets weird because Pirates of the Caribbean. I had two lines in it, two yeah. lines, and I wanted to do it because it was like my agent said. She said, "Don't do it. Don't do it. It's two lines." Um, you're better than that kind of thing. And I said to her, look, I'm from Salford. If somebody wants to pay me a large amount of money to go to Hawaii for six weeks, Los Angeles for three weeks, and they get to be a pirate, if I turned it down, all my mates who are bricklayers and sparkies, they'd kick shit out of me. And they'd be right to. It was two lines, and I don't even think it belongs on my CV. It is. I it I got, well, it's here. I and think I've got the to take it off because I don't feel like I've contributed anything to it. If you cut my two lines out, the plot would not be affected of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, it well, wouldn't be affected at all because it was a minor role. Having said that, yeah, it was a great experience. Six That's weeks away and three weeks LA, blah, blah, blah. Loads That's of money at Pirates. Come on. That was exactly. And did you meet Mr. Depp? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, we had quite a good laugh with Johnny Depp and Stephen yeah. Graham. Because there was this bloke, there was this, oh, I'm going on now. That's all right, carry on. He was Johnny in it, and he was a right pain in the ass. He was like, hi, ladies, I'm Johnny Standing. A right toss pot he was. <laughs> <laughs> and one night, I was in this hotel and I was having a drink, and this woman said to hit me up, and went, Oh, where are you from? Uh, Manchester. What are you doing here? Said the Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh my God, Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp, we love it. You're in a film with Johnny Depp. So I said, Yeah, yeah. So she said, Oh, come upstairs and meet me. Kids, I went, No. I went, well, I'm not fucking Johnny Depp. They're going to open the, open the doors and say, He's in a film. And they're going to go, Who is it? Next thing, Johnny Depp's lookalike came in. Brilliant. Oh, I thought, All right. I called him over. Yeah, I went, yeah. What do you do? He went, Hi, I'm Johnny Standing. So she went, oh, we meet the kids. And he went upstairs and said hello to the kids. It was awful. I went up just to see what happened. They were yeah. asleep on the floor in sleeping bags. And a drunken mum opens the door, practically kicks the door in. <laughs> going to go ape shit because she's got somebody who resembles Johnny Depp. Yeah. Spoke to him once. Yeah. And she went, hey, this is where's with Johnny Depp? And the kids were like, so what? <laughs> but yeah, Johnny Depp, because I used to do, do, do really good stories with him about, actually it's come back to haunt me now, like he could be out on the piss and he'd go home and his wife would say, where have you been you bastard? And she's about to throw a pan at him and he'd go, hang on, the face, the face, and he'd get his standing, put his standing in front of him and go, yeah, what are you going to do about it now, you fucking bitch? And she'd throw the pans but at the standing. So every, every day there was a new story about Johnny's standing getting battered in, in his play. <laughs> oh, fan, oh what, another fabulous memory there. <laughs> I'm going Good to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> nice. so, um, I've got here a couple of fabulous classics that you've you've been in. Um, Wuthering Heights and Anna Karenina. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Um, what can you tell again, me about Wuthering they Heights? Were uh, it was Andrea Arnold who'd done uh, Wuthering Heights. Yeah. And uh, it's a really, really bleak, well, I won't say modern, it's set in the same time. Yeah. I think it's shot in black and white. It's all handheld. 35 miller, again, razor blade cuts. Yeah. <clears throat> again, Andrea won't let you see the script. She likes working in dark with you a little bit. Right. But there's a lot of improvisation in that. Um, not much to tell, really. I played Joseph in it. Yeah, uh, it was a cold, hard shoot up on the moors and pissing down cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a miserable yeah. shoot, but an enjoyable one all the same. And Anna Karenina, you know, what did I do in that? You played something called Theodore. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. With um, ah. Donald Gleeson, I was a mate of his in it. I think I had a couple of scenes with Donald Gleeson in it when we were sighted. <laughs> all good projects, you know, yes, and that's to yeah, be involved yeah. in. What brilliant classic, you know, titles, I mean, to have those credits, you know, I mean, uh, they're evergreens and they'll never, never fade, you know, True. I think that's brilliant. So I'm going to move on swiftly um, to uh, a recent, well, I'm assuming a very recent one, A Very British Christmas. Oh, yeah, I've never seen that. It was, uh, I think it was done for the, I don't know if it's the American market, 
It's like them channels that they put them. I think there's a whole sort of channel dedicated to these feel good kind of films that don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in that now, Rachel Fenton, I think. She was the lead in it and some bloke. Yeah, yeah. I've not seen it. I can't tell you much about it to be honest. Well, except well, I'm okay. it no um, well, right, we'll move on to some of your telly now, if we may. Um, um some of your earliest stuff. And funny enough, I saw saw you in one of them. Heartbeat. <laughs> I've been in Heartbeat three times. Right. As three different characters. I'm trying to find them as you saw. Yeah. Yeah, your first <laughs> one was Mr. Coulson, I think. That was that's why I've got here. Oh, Mr. Paulson. Yeah. Was he a car thief? He was one who was a car thief. That's oh, a car dealer. He was one who was a pet, petty thief, and one who was a, a badger baiter or something like that. Okay. Well, the other one I've got here is a character, Denny Barlow. Maybe. Oh, Denny Barlow. He was a crook. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So we've got some very interesting ones here. One, one that but, really does interest me. Can, um, can I just say, John? Can sure. I just say about? About Heartbeat, the casting director of that, Malcolm Drury. Right. The chain smoking, foul mouth get. He was a wonderful bloke. Yeah. And he, he rang me and he said, Steve, God, great part for you. Heartbeat, Heartbeat. You, you, you'll piss it, you'll piss it. And I, and I went, Malcolm, I've, I've been in it twice as mm. two other people. And he went quiet and he went, They won't fucking remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did they? <laughs> no. You all <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, on a more sombre note for something that you were in, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's not the most pleasant of subjects, um, but people have seen it. Um, the Moors murder, murders. Oh, yeah. Terrible, yeah. Uh, again, some of these things stay with you, you know. I, I yeah. played uh, um, David Smith's dad in that. Oh my word. It was quite harrowing to be a part of it. Yes. But it was split I've done I've done not long ago as well that kind of really got to me called Bancroft. Oh yes, yes. And I played a bloke whose whose daughter was murdered years ago. It was a cold case that got reopened. Mm -hmm. And I found that a really depressing job only because I've got daughters, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so, it was kind yeah. of weird. Um mm. I mean, for you know, kind of dealing with this project and putting yourself in the place of what yeah. would you be like if it was your daughter? It's really yes, terrible. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, That's how did you find with you something like that? You, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got to finish your day's work. You've got to go home. What did you do to to try and, if at all possible, to to kind of kick that out your mind until you went back? I don't. I don't. I let it. I put it in a car and I let it fester. I always like things first. I don't purge anything if I can help it. No, no, no. I think it's, all, it's all part of the learning curve. Yes, um, yes. I, I'd rather, I know when something's on my mind and it's usually for a good reason. Right. And sometimes it can help the performance yeah. or it can hinder it. Mm. I think it's up to you to channel any kind of negativity, mm. negativity yeah. into positivity. Yes. And, yes. It's like the, and the important thing as well is before we got the equity card, with the knife in, I got knifed. I got, I was in, I was off for about a year. Yeah. I got stabbed through the liver, the lung and diaphragm. I had my throat cut and I got glassed in the face. Oh and it was on a life support machine. This was when we were trying to get our equity cards. This messed things up for a while. Mm. I was on a life support machine and the knife was infected and it, my stomach swelled out and I had to, burst my stomach and get all the pus out and pack it with bloody uh, fresh tape every day and then mm. fresh tape. Yeah, oh, they put, they put these holes they put these holes in you and put this tape in that soaks up the infection. Mm. I had to have that pulled out every day in, in five holes on my stomach. Mm. The, the, my ribs was infected. Anyway, they had to take out three pieces of ribs and I had six major operations for that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I remember being on a walking stick and I was down to eight stone because it was pretty, it was a tough one, that. And I, I couldn't wait to get back on stage to get these equity cards. And, and we did it. We did it. In less than a year after me getting stabbed, when they wrote me off and said I couldn't do anything like that again, 
I'd had three bits of rib out, I'd had an operation, the life saving one, one for a burst blood vessel, and one for adhesions blocking your intestines. I had all that shit, yeah. and uh, I, I just uh, refused to, to count tight to it and it's got our equity cards. Yeah, yeah, good, good for you, and 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 you know. Do you think that that, that in terms of strength, is that actually happening? Do you think that's made you stronger? Right. Or, or? Do you register yourself, and if there's somebody who's already registered, somebody the turn the well, microphone off. Different names because somebody's already jumped in there first. And even if. So yeah, I mean, do you feel that because of what happened, has that made you, as the years have gone along, has it made you stronger mentally? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because I, I remember when it happened, and I had a gig. I could hear someone's voice. Just a moment. Only on the night it happened, which was Mother's Day, um, I was in the ambulance getting rushed to the hospital. I had a gig the next day, a comedy gig I was doing with a mate of mine, and we needed the Twilight Zone music. It was on TV that night. Right. My brother was in the ambulance with me. He said my neck was wide open where he cut my throat. He missed a juggler. Mm. But I was, in, I was in the ambulance, and as we were rushing to a Salford Royal, I said to my brother, take the Twilight Zone tonight, thinking I was going to be gigging the next oh day. I didn't get out of bed for about two, two and a half months because I couldn't. No. Um, but I remember after the life-saving operation, I was uh, 32 units of blood was put through me. I was in the operating theatre for over 20 hours mm. and when I woke up it paralysed me from my neck down for my own safety because I had tubes coming out of every orifice yeah. and I had a great big industrial tube down my mouth helping me breathe because my lung had been punctured as well. Uh, but I remembered opening my eyes mm. and my very first conscious thought was I'm alive. Yes. And that was it. And that mm. was it. I was alive. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's very yeah. adverse, and I was just determined to get through it and not let it. Mm. I, you know, I could have gone the other way. I could have sat in the house, never gone in a pub again. Yeah, yeah. But on yeah. the day I was discharged from that hospital, mm. I was with my girlfriend, well, mother of my kids now. I said, I'm going straight back to that pub. Mm. She said, no, you're not. And I did. She yeah. wouldn't come in with me. I got a taxi. Mm. And I walked straight back in that pub, and the landlord couldn't believe it. He was like... He thought I was dead. It was like he'd seen a ghost, and I got a pint. I didn't want a pint. Mm. I didn't want anything, but I thought this is out. This was my therapy. Yeah. I went straight back in that pub. I bought a pint. I stood at the same spot where I got knifed, mm. and I drank the pint. Must have took me an hour and a half because it was the last thing I wanted. They gave me the pint on the house, and I left. And that was my way of dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah, I applaud you for that, Steve. Honest to Everyone's God. Everyone's different. Yeah. Everyone's different. Well, that's that's how I did it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's 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 something that obviously, you know, you have been so open about this, and and you know, there's some people that wouldn't even talk about it, but you know, I've got utter and total respect, as I'm sure everybody that's on here and everybody else that that, well, that respects you for what you do. It's just a thing that happened to me, you know. Yeah, and I refuse yeah. to let it be get bogged down about it and let it dictate my life. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not playing that. No, 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 no. no. Well, okay. Um, so we're going to move on on this, uh, Steve. Um, yeah. Now, now, I believe that was something that you really enjoyed doing. I think you're in about three series of that. Were you Rev? Oh, Rev. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what can you tell us about Rev? Rev? Rev was great. I'll tell you what got me the job with Rev. A coat. I was at Walmart once. Yeah. And I was, I'd had some MDMA or something, and it was cold. So I went in one of these stores and I bought a big duffel coat, and that was that. Yeah. And when I went to the audition for Rev, um, I got a recall, and it was some of the bench scenes that I did with Tom Hollander, because Tom was the vicar, and my character Colin was, for those who don't know, he's like a homeless alcoholic. But he did believe in God. He was he was a practicing Christian, yeah. but he wasn't very bright. But he was a lovely character. So there was always these bench scenes with Colin and the priest that were always an integral part of each episode. So when I got the recall, it was with Tom Tom Hollander doing the bench scenes, 
And I had that duffel coat with me and I took it and I threw it on the floor. And we'd done the scenes and the director said, mm, put your coat on and do them again. So I put my coat on and we'd done it again. Anyway, I got the job. So then we went for the wardrobe fitting and the wardrobe women, when I went down, they'd bought, I had my duffel coat on again. Yeah. And they bought three duffel coats for the character. So they went, oh, we try this one on. So I took mine off, threw it on the floor, and tried their first one on, they took photos and they went, no. Put yours on again, I put mine on again, took photos. They went, try the second one on, put mine off, second one, they went, no. Try yours again, I put mine on again. They went, try the third one, they took photos. And they went, put yours on again and I put mine on again and bless him he didn't have the heart to say it was the best shittiest coat there. <laughs> <laughs> he just stood there looking at me like going and I went would you like me to use my coat as the character I went oh would you mind awfully darling that would be lovely so my coat got me the job ah but just what, 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 what they used to do as well is take my coat off they skank it up <laughs> character and wear it and at the end of these these series mm. it, You'd send it to my house dry cleaned with six bottles of champagne. Wow. <laughs> and a case of champagne and my coat all pristine. And have you still got that coat? Oh yeah, still got it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, yeah. So every time you every time you wear that, you think I wore it for ages, because last time I wore it, everyone, hey, call me in you piss <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, okay, moving on. Um, can you tell us a bit about your character, Bertrand Galiz? Is it in The Musketeers? Oh, uh, well, not much to say, really. Just a oh. token character. Small village taken over by the baddies, coming in and ruining it. Bertrand's like the elder of the village, but he's not got any, any strength or power to deal with the marauders who come in. Yeah, he's got a daughter who obviously has got more balls than him, and uh, she's the driving force behind him, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she gets the help of the musketeers, and uh, they come in and save the day. But again, yeah, a lovely job, the musketeers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was filmed in uh, Prague or Hungary. I can't remember. Brilliant, that. brilliant. Uh, Death in Paradise. Now that Death in Paradise again. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> I've never seen Death in Paradise. And the agent rang me and said, straight offer, no audition, death in paradise. I said, it rings a bell, that. Is that filmed abroad? Yeah. She said, it's two weeks in the French Caribbean. I went, I'll do it. <laughs> she said, you don't, even, you don't even know what the part is yet. I said, I don't care. <laughs> two weeks in the Caribbean, I'm doing it. Is that Chris Marshall? Death Chris Marshall did yes. it then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chris, he'd just taken over. Right. Uh, but the director of that was Paul Murphy, yeah. who I've worked with before. This is how it's always good. People like Paul Murphy keep you in mind. Yes, yes. I'd yes. worked with him when I was on my ass doing anything when he was acting. Yeah. We did a project that never came to anything. It never happened. Mm. But he kept me in mind, Paul, and he asked for me straight off the bat, no audition. Yeah. I want others to do this part. Yes. Yeah. You knew I could do it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, every thing. little piece, it all comes together in the big jigsaw at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is it. You see, you can do one job and then, you know, it might be just a minor role in something and you never hear from that person again for a long time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, out of the yeah. blue, um, they'll suddenly say, oh, I remember Steve when he was in Sunset. And oh, like you said, he'll call you in, somebody will call you in for something. It, so, you know. It's true what they say, there is no minor roles, you're all part of the cogs, no. all part of the cogs. Absolutely. I know I've just contradicted myself saying he could take a couple of lines out of something and it doesn't affect the plot. But, mm. you know, no, we're all as important as each other, cast yeah. and crew, it's, just, yeah. it's yeah. a great yeah. system. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Absolutely. A uh, couple of, um, well, pol well, police and the death in paradise, there seems to be a little pattern here. Uh, Mid Midsummer Murders playing Philip Faulkner. Yeah, that, again, that was a straight off of that job. Yeah. Uh, that was great, that. Um, that was a UFO and all that. I have had a tin foil hat and all that. And a That's right. It was it on, on quite it. recently. Yes, yes. Yeah, it has been on recently. I've got this guy who goes in the pub. Trevor knows him, Chappie. Trevor knows Chappie. He'll only watch some at Chappie if I die in it. <laughs> That's what he does. I say, <laughs> someone will go, I'll go, uh, oh, I'm on telly here next week. He'll go, do you die in it? And I go, no, you go, I'm not watching it then. <laughs> so Trevor's <laughs> laughing because Trevor knows. And uh, he, he, he couldn't wait to see that because 
He said, oh, what, you're in Midsummer Murders? Do you get killed in it? I said, yeah, you get killed, mate. He went, oh, I can't wait to see that. <laughs> and then uh, on to one of my favourite series, and you've appeared twice as George, um, Vera. Vera, yeah. With the wonderful Brenda Blethyn. Indeed. Again, um, nice, because I originally went for another part in Vera that was so far removed from George, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And the director, I think it was called John Hayes at the time. Yeah. But I didn't get that, but he said to me, have a crack at uh, George, who works with Vera. Mm. And what I liked about George was he's completely not me. He's mm. softly, soft-spoken, uh, hides away in the basement doing missing persons. He's got a soft spot for Vera. Yeah. <laughs> which is, it should be able to come across, but without him being too, too uh, forward or, or creepy yeah. about it, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but it was nice to play George. And it's nice that he comes back every now and again. Yes. Uh, yes. Or when missing persons raise its head. Yeah, of course. Uh, so how did, how nice. did you get on with um, Brenda Blethyn? How did you get on with it? Absolutely great. She, yeah. She's great, Brenda, yeah. Oh, uh, no complaints at all. Uh, the whole cast and crew love her. It's her yes. baby. She's like the big cheese on it. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's absolutely great to do them scenes with her. Um, yeah. I think he kind of, George, asked her out in an awkward way to a pub that there was a meat raffle on. You know, that's, yeah, that's yeah. how sophisticated George is. <laughs> but again, nice, nice character to play. Oh, brilliant. And then we're going to talk about something that I'm going to be, I'm going to admit to this. I don't have Sky. Um, and oh, I'm desperate to see it. And that has to be the one and only Brassic. So you've got to tell us how all that started. Uh, well, press it. You can watch it on Now TV. You don't have to get Sky. Oh, okay. Get Now TV for the a seven day trial. Binge watch it and then get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Now TV. I haven't got Sky. Uh, press it again. Yeah, let's go uh, back on after. Hmm? Yeah, let's go back on. No. Right. Yeah, press it. So. Um, same thing. Got a brief. Uh, Farmer Jim went down to the audition. Uh, Joe was there, uh, casting director, director, a room full of people really. Mm -hmm. I just went in, there was a guy outside actually, who, when I saw him I thought, well I don't know what I'm doing here because he looked like a stereotypical farmer to me. Mm. Um, but I, I just went in and, and did my best and uh, brilliantly enough got the job because I, I love the character of Jim. Yeah. I just love his, his, his little his little rages against the world and his, his anger and all yeah, that yeah, and his, yeah. his, his bluntness, he doesn't care. Mm. And now we're going into, we start the third series of, of um, Brassic. Yeah. So we, we're doing something right. And it's just a, a joy to work on. Uh, six yeah. episodes was first and second series. We're doing eight, yeah. eight this time. Mm -hmm. Great cast, great crew, great laugh on set, you know, just, just a great, job to be on. I've got, to ask, I've got to ask you this, how much of Jim is in you? <laughs> well, um, a fair bit, fair bit about moaning at people and um, just sometimes saying the wrong thing. Yeah, quite a lot of, of Jim. Um, well, I've got to catch, I mean, if you know, I've seen, I've seen little bits of it and it, it's, it's a must, I, I really must um, uh, uh, watch this. Um, we're coming up shortly to the Q&A, but um, yep. I'm going to ask you this. Um, so, how are Rosie, Sophie, Sally and Tyrone? I don't know! Right. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Sophie, Rosie! No, that's just a bit of fun. It's one of them things that gets out of the hand. It's like the Aspen Earring lads, the engineering firm down the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I started yeah. asking them for a while and uh, mm -hmm. people thought it was a TV series. It, it, they want more now. <laughs> I'll have to go back and ask them again and make more. It's just a piss take, just something to do in your daytime when you're bored, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all, all in good heart and all in good fun. And, and yeah. you know, you've Absolutely. really, you know, kept a lot of people, I would say a big percentage of especially my followers, you know, that, that, that comment, and you've kept people's spirits up, Stephen. Well, that's our job in times of trouble. We are the entertainment industry, yes. you know. Yes. We're, we're the uh, wandering minstrel. We're, we're the court jester. Yes. 
Yeah. We're the people who entertain the troops. Mm. You've got to remember, when it, whenever there's a depression mm. or something's really wrong, people want to be entertained. And that's our job. That's where we come in. Yeah. You know, COVID-19, it's changed the way of life. Nobody's ever dealt with this before because nobody's been alive when it's happened previously. Mm -hmm. It's completely changed the, the goalposts. And yeah. we, as entertainers, that's our job. When there's a war on, we go in to, to cheer up the troops. We're good for morale. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing in this lockdown. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to go on Twitter and tell people how pissed off I am or how depressed I am or what. I just want to make one person laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Just give them a smile in the day. Then I've done my job as a member of the entertainment business. Yes. People want to watch TV and films and escapism when there's times of trouble. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Steve. I mean, it's, you know, and long may that continue throughout this uh, oh, yeah. that we're all going through. No, please, you know, uh, it's, 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 you know, you, you can't thank you enough for this. Okay, look, um, you've heard enough of me waffling on, so I'm going to, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and it's not, it's not favouritism in any shape or form. We've got to bring Trevor on, please. Can I just get a beer? I'll be one minute. Oh, just yeah. get a beer. <laughs> He's just going to get a beer. Yeah. Okay, so um, have we got a show of hands from anybody? I mean, who, who's, well, I'm sure you all want to ask questions. Um, right, Luke, Jefferson. Okay, I think, yeah, Jefferson. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Um, oh, you can put your little emoji hand up just to remind me, please. Uh, and also you as well, Luke. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll kick off with Jefferson. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and fire away with your question for Steve. Right. Thank you. Well, firstly, yeah, John, thank you for organising this, as ever. Um, and yeah, Steve, thank you so much for your time. No worries. That's all right. Yeah, I just wanted to firstly say, yeah, thank you so much for the Aspen Engineering series. I had um, <laughs> I had appendicitis surgery, uh, which, I, <laughs> which I've been trying to recover from for about nearly three months now. So that really got me through it. So really <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. That's um, <laughs> yeah, but my yeah, my question is, um, so with the role of Jim in Brassic, um, how much of that was improvised? Um, and especially the, uh, the the classic scene you did in series two with the disco biscuit. How much right. of that was uh, was improved? Absolutely none of it was improvised. Not one word wow. was improvised. It was all written down by Danny Brocklers. The only kind of thing I improvise about Jim is his little fits of anger. So I put them in, yeah. like for instance, in that speech where he said, with the, the fucking oversized sunglasses and the fucking designer wellies. You know, <laughs> the thought of anyone having designer wellies fills him with rage. And, and that's the only thing I've kind of brought to Jim is these little pockets of like, ah, and then he's back in the room. Yeah. Um, but in answer yeah. to your question, not one single word of that was improvised. It was all written down. And the beauty of it, trying to make it, is look like it's improvised. And then you know you're on the right track. Well, you've definitely done something right there because, yeah, that was, I, I couldn't tell. So, yeah, that was, that was amazing. Well, great. But, um, good but yeah. Oh, that was good yeah. Well, we I can't can't wait till series three. Um, do you know? Uh, do you have a, a an idea when we're due to be released? Is it a twenty twenty one thing? I have no idea, not in the slightest. Uh, I know we start filming next month. There's eight episodes. Oh, that's amazing. So I don't know how long it, this shoot's going to be, but I should think it'll be next year. Um, you never know. You never know. No, I, well, very much looking forward to it. And yeah, thank you for your time, Steve. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Jefferson, for your question. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Michaela, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Um, first off, oh, hi. Um, first off, thank you for your time. It's really awesome that you're doing this. Um, my question is about uh, summer. 
and I was just curious what was it like working on that film um, and working together with Robert Carlyle because this was it was a pretty it's a pretty emotionally intense film and yeah. I'm just uh, curious as an actor how you uh, dealt with the emotions of the character and just the entire thing. Well, yeah, uh, Summer is a film that's very close to my heart. And again, that came around by the director of that was called um, Kenny Glennon. And I'd worked with him on a series called Buried before Summer, uh, which was a prison drama. And I went for an audition um, covered in shit, actually, because I was working with my mate. Dean Andrews was there for Buried, and he said he'll never am amount to anything. And I got the job on Buried. Right, but that leads me to the next bit, because when Kenny was doing Summer, he asked me to just read in the character that I was playing, not to be in it, just to come to a read-through. So we went to the read-through. Uh, George Costigan was there, and a lot of cast and crew. It was the read-through, although I had been told that I wasn't going to be playing the part. They wanted somebody with a, a, more of a name, uh, a name. <coughs> but I did it at the read-through. Kenny just sat there with his eyes closed, listening to everything. And at the end of it, he said, I want you to play Daz. I want you to be my Daz. Uh, I didn't know Robert Carlyle was going to be in it then. And I just thought, well, yeah, you do. It's nice you want me in it, but the powers that be won't. And then uh, I just kind of left it and deleted it. And then I got a call off Kenny, and he said, you're going to be playing Daz. And I went, oh, man, that's great. And he said, yeah, and your mate's going to be Robert Carlyle in it. So to me, that was quite a buzz, because I'm a great admirer of, of Bobby's work. Uh, and I just got on great with Bobby. And dealing with it emotionally, this is one of the things I had to. Uh, again, my, my father died of cancer, and my sister, younger sister and brother, have both died of cancer. So as ugly as it is, you just have to mind that that emotion that you, you went through and the times you went through uh, to 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 make it work. And I like to think I did do it without getting too maudlin about it. But some of a really lovely project. And I'm I'm glad you you liked it because not a lot of people know that film exists. And I yeah, think I love it. It's beautiful. I think uh, just it's just beautiful. Full stop. Yeah. It's beautiful. Nice one, Mikhail. I appreciate that. And it's lovely how it moves between the time zones. We see the resignation of old age, the enthusiasm of youth and the naivete. And it's, it's interesting to watch these people be fresh and young and then see them old and, you know, given up really on everything. Mm, interesting. Thank you, Michaela. Thanks very much. Luke, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, Luke. You're all right, Steve. Yeah, mate. Oh, uh, great. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, obviously, now that COVID's affected both, um, obviously, how theatre and stage is, and it is going to be a time to recover. Uh, I just want to ask your opinion on what you thought of, obviously we hear that they're trying to get more opportunities for working class actors or actors don't, who don't have a higher income like you know, the Cumber Batches and the, and the Rada kids. Um, I was just wondering, what, being someone from Salford and uh, like working hard like you have to, do you think there's still a divide for working class actors and actors who have benefits or do you think that there is a growing, it is, it's getting recognised without it being pre constantly preached, in a sense. Yeah, I still do still think there's a divide between working class actors trying to get a foot in the door and, let's say, upper class. And that's just down to monetary things, you know, how, how people with rich parents can afford to go into RAD or they don't have to worry about, you know, where the next meal's coming from, where the next bill's going to be paid. So, yeah, what a bloody lovely world that is that we could all live in. Uh, but having said that, I do think there's more opportunities coming through for working class people because I think people in the business are starting to realise that there's a wealth, an absolute wealth of experience and, 
stuff there to be mined because it, the working class, the upper class doing all that is great, but you need to bring a, a hunger to some parts. You need to have that, that thing inside you that drives you on. And if daddy, mummy, daddy has paid for everything, all your headshots and your holidays abroad and that, then there's something lacking in you that you're not hungry is striving for. Is you're striving is what it is. And that's what a lot of us work in. We should be more, there should be bursaries given. These people should be spotted the same way football teams now scout young footballers. They've got young footballers signed on their books when they're eight years of age and six years of age and all that. They should be casting directors, I don't know, someone going out to these schools and trying to see this, this stuff and nurture it from the word go, but not in a, in a sense that daddy's got all the money. It needs to be that hunger to strive, but why should we be bad because of our accents or where we have the misfortune to be born or, you know what I mean? How dare they? We we're as much as interested in the arts as anybody else. And we have our voice and our place in it. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just a shame that all the, the rich ones seem to have all the, there's a lot of bribery and corruption going on still. You've got to fight all the way. Yeah, no, true, man. May I just say, I think that what you've said, Steve, is absolutely brilliant, is right, because, you know, it makes us value what we've got, doesn't it? Mm. And if it's handed to you on a plate, almost, like you say, that strive is taken away, and it's, everything's just such an easy ride, or it would seem that way, whereas, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm back, sort of working, working class, you know, from, from Hull, and, you know, I never had any um, financial backing, and like a lot of people, you know, we, we've had to push our way and get our way on and, and find out, mark our own path out, and, and, and yeah. it's absolutely right. So, you know, great points there to bring up, mention Luke, I really, you know. Yeah, no, it's not Luke. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks very much indeed. Um, Denise, no if you'd like to unmute, please. Hi, Steve. Um, Hi, you all right? I've, yeah, I've had a great evening. It's really lovely listening to your stories. Um, some really good stuff there. I wanted to find out a little bit more about um, the roles or scenes that were incredibly difficult for, for you and how you worked around those or prepared for them. Because um, obviously you've done a lot of stuff that you've, you've really enjoyed doing, but what are the ones that really challenged you? Um, mm, I think... The ones that really challenge me is um, the really like emotional or crying ones. I yeah. seem to not be able to get in in the frame of mind sometimes because it's it's all very well you can prepare at home for it and all that, but when you do get on set, the intimacy goes. You know when there's fifty yeah. people stood around you and you're trying to like to, to cry over something. It's so hard to, for me to do that sometimes. I don't think I can, I don't think I'm very good at it. And the, the reason why I, I think I can get away with it is like, I always try and play these sad emotional scenes as though I don't want to do them because I think that's how a lot of people, men, particularly men, and I say that for a reason, particularly men don't want to talk about things like emotion. So I think if you, if you do, I think it's kind of nice for me to play it as though I don't want to be saying it, so there's kind of a lid on it and there's something steaming mm. over there. I don't know whether it works or not, but I, I, I envy people like um, <laughs> Olivia Coleman. She can just turn on the waterworks at, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. at the drop of a hat and yet make it believable. I mean, truly is a skill. I don't think I, I possess that. Um, I like to think... Uh, when I get on set, I know what I'm doing. Um, to a certain extent, I do, but it doesn't always work as planned. To be to be honest, Nice. I'd, I'm exactly with you on that because that's my thing too. So I always uh, holding back tears, or I'll have a solitary tear that will run down my face. But to actually let go is the mm. hardest thing for me. Yeah, it's very hard for me as well. And um, there is loads of tricks behind the scenes to accommodate it, which I have used, 
and it looks good at the end, but it's, it's some people can just do it and some some can't. I don't think yeah. I can. No. How how's do, how are they on set? So with the tricks, for example, you know, I always sort of feel I'd feel like I cheated myself. Like you, I do a lot of preparation well, before I go on set. Well, you don't and if it's not there. Well, yeah, I know, but there's time constraints, isn't there, on things? It's all very well if you're working with, like, I don't know, Stanley Kubrick, who will do 73 takes of somebody yeah. opening the door, because he can. But when, when you're, particularly, I think, in soaps or series, where there's strict deadlines, uh, where they can't afford to go over, because the line producer and the producer say, just get the scene done, just get it done, mm-hmm. and let's move on. And that's where the conveyor belt, conveyor belt acting can come into the industry sometimes. I was actually watching Crossroads once. Mm. Now, I'm not kidding. A picture fell off the wall. <laughs> well, I'm not kidding. I'll never forget it. There was two characters having a dialogue, and a picture fell off the wall. And it wasn't part of the plot, because they never... They just sort of looked at it, and they carried on. It was a take. A picture <laughs> fell off the wall in the middle of a take and he didn't have time to do another one. And, you know, that speaks volumes about some things. Yeah. yeah. I try and bring what I can to a part um, and do what I can, really. I think if you're feeling it, people see that and you're absolutely yeah. right. Holding it back can be actually more emotive to people. But absolutely. I'm with you in, in wanting to let go and just... Yeah. to free flow with those tears but <laughs> <laughs> thank you Denise. thank you that's great uh mike hi mike hi can you hear me yeah i can hear yeah. you thank you very much hi, hi steve mike Holman. you okay i'm all right mike yeah it's uh just uh for myself just to pass on thanks uh i'm not sure if you remember a few a while ago you came over to my wife's shop baked cakes in bake up oh yeah cake. they were great then yeah yeah just like to pass on uh, thanks for coming over and supporting a local business for my wife and also pass on thanks to the to the cast and the crew of uh, Brassett. Uh, how respectful they are, et cetera, when they're filming and everything. Just uh, great professionals. Uh, and likewise, keep up with the Twitter. Like you say, it it sort of makes uh, makes the day a bit easier going through with COVID, et cetera. Just for from me, just what what's next for yourself with with obviously you've got Brassic three coming up with a filming, but what what's next for yourself? Where do you see yourself going, or what is there anything in the pipeline really, or do you yeah, still with the yeah, flow? Yeah, there is there is stuff in the pipeline, but I'm one of them. I'm not going to say anything about it. I, yeah. I, I I don't do that, mate. I don't even tell anyone when I've got an audition. I don't when I come out of the audition, I never ring my agent to see how I've done. Never. Yeah. I just delete it. I, I have got things in the pipeline, very exciting things as well that I wish I could tell you now. Um, but I'm not gonna because no, no. I'm I'm I don't like jinxing things. I don't like sound, saying something and then it doesn't come off. Yeah, no. It's like agree. saying I'm gonna run the marathon and I do 500 yards, I'm going to look like an idiot. I'd rather not say anything. And when I come back and I've done the marathon, I go, there's my medal for doing it. You know, I, I like, I, I've got stuff in the pipeline. That's very exciting for me, actually, especially at this stage of my life. So, um, in answer to your question, there is stuff in the pipeline, there is. But get them cookies sorted, because we'll be up bake up soon in September. We want cookies! Yeah, yeah, we'll get them on. Don't worry, Steve. It's uh, it's something that my wife set up as a. She, she used to work for the NHS, and because uh, of circumstances, she she set this business up. So it it's something that I'm proud of. So I'm pushing it from my side. So if I sound like a bit of a rabbiting on, I'm pushing it from my side. But it, it's something that I want to support my wife in doing. So thanks for uh, thanks for supporting, and we'll see you see you in the coming weeks. You Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, Emma. Hello. Over to you. Hello. So a... Hi, you're you right, Steve. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, can I just apologise for my unmuting in error before? Uh, oh, so my... oh, no, I shouted at my daughter as well, and then it was like, can you, can you... I was like, oh, no. I'm really sorry. Um, anyway, question. Which do you prefer, being on stage or being in front of the camera? 
and with your character in Brassic, now because you're going into series three, are you allowed to do your own sort of, you know, you know your character inside out, can you just put things in that isn't in the script from Danny? Uh, well, first of all, uh, theatre or TV these days, it's TV for me. Um, I, I love the whole process. What I love about the TV at the moment is, is the way it is shot out of sequence. I used to not like it. But what I love now is when I read a script and I know what scenes have been done, <clears throat> I like filling them in visually. Mm. So the whole project comes together at the end. I love it. Um, <clears throat> Theatre is a completely different discipline, as you know. And I think it'd be um, great to do some theatre now because that's all I used to do. But I've got spoiled a bit with the TV world. I prefer the TV world. I just love, um, like I say, going in, getting it done, leaving, let somebody else do that bit, and everybody's got that bit to do. And everybody works together as a team. And when you see the end product, it's just such a buzz. Um, I can't remember the second part of your question. Uh, the next one is, are you able to um, oh. put part, you know, like add things uh, to oh. your character? I dare say, uh, well, yeah, because what, what generally happens is once the scene is, is in the can, as we say, and the director, spe specifically John Wright, <coughs> the director, <coughs> excuse me, he says, right, well, let's do one now and just have fun with it. Just do what you want with it. So they've already got it. And then mm. we just do, and that's when you can <coughs> throw something in, improvise, do this, do that. And sometimes they make the cut. Sometimes you don't. The but scene it, where, where, sorry to interrupt you, the no scene problem. with your underpants, was that in <coughs> prop or was that written in? <laughs> no, 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 you write these things in the bastards, just to, just to get me embarrassed. <laughs> You're just so funny and the one, the rant in the field about the, dis, the raves, I just can't get enough, brilliant. All written, all written by uh, Danny. So yes. I love Jim, I love the Jim for that. <laughs> But thank you, they're my questions. Enjoying tonight, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Meryl. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Meryl. My mood is hello. Um, speaking as someone that probably sounds like a posh bird, um, <laughs> but I'm not rich. Um, yeah, uh, I've forgotten what it was. Um, so, I mean, probably nobody knows the answer, but you've been in the business quite a long time. It's been really interesting hearing your stories, so thank you very much for that. Um, I wonder if there's a general thing, I mean, the thing that you've been talking about is helping, you know, different voices be heard, you know, which is, which is great. But is there some sort of, you know, general advice about what, what, what is the main thing someone starting off needs to hang on to, whether they're working class, northern, southern, rich, posh, work, you know, working class, what, what, whatever. What, what's, do you have a view on that? What's the main thing people need to hang on to? Is it just to be true to yourself or, you know, what, what would you say? Because I'm well, sure it has to be room for everybody in this. Um, of course it has to be room for everybody. Yeah, everybody should be represented because we are trying to portray life as it is. Um, what do we have? You have to have that drive within yourself, that is something that you cannot be taught, you cannot buy, you cannot get lessons to teach you determination or what your heart's telling you. I think it's either in you or it isn't. Mm. And for anybody starting out, I think who needs to be told to have confidence in themselves, I think they should know that anyway. And I think they will have that anyway. Um, I hate to say it, but sometimes people fall by the wayside and maybe that's the right thing to happen. I don't know. I really can't say. I just think if that drive is within you, then it can't be taught, it can't be bought, it can't be improvised, it's there or it's not. And I just think I have the determination because I figured out there wasn't anything else I wanted to do. That was mm. prepared to what, what age were you when you started, Steve? Oh, well, I started quite late. Um, I didn't get my equity card till about, in fact, it was 1988, I think it was. You were 88? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. 
was 1988, I think, when we got our equity cards. Um, it's, I, I've not done it the right way. I've not done it the textbook way. I've done it all the wrong way. Um, and I wouldn't recommend anyone to go down my path. But it's all come together now, all these little jigsaws over the years. It's all come together now, and I'm really, really in a happy place mm. with my family. Um, first of all, my family, my daughters and my grandkids, are just everything to me. Uh, I'm in a happy place with them, and it trickles down to work. And yeah, yeah. Because I was going to say, you know, if you're if you're in that sort of place, then you can be more relaxed when you're kind of well, you probably don't audition there, but you know, if you do, you probably no, I still I don't audition a lot, mate. You know, and a lot of stuff I don't get, but you can't you can't let some you can't let a knockback compound itself to negativity. Mm. You might not get four jobs on the trot, so what? Mm. It doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with losing or not getting a job. There's nothing wrong with failure. Failure is normal. It's normal. I have failed so many times, so many times, and I'm glad I have, because that's where I come back stronger, more determined, more passion, and I learn from it. It's great to fail. Embrace it. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with it. Don't let a bit of negative energy that you didn't get a job, carry on to the next job, because now you're not going to get it. And then that, you're not, forget it. Delete these things from your head. Come out of the audition, forget about it. Don't be ringing your agent. How did I do? How did I do? You know how you did. They'll tell you how you did it was in the room. You'll either get the job or you'll not get the job or you'll get a recall. They're the only three things that will ever happen. You got the job. You didn't get the job. We want to see you again. That's it. Mm. Anyway, no, it's been a lovely evening, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. Thanks, Meryl. Uh, Laura. Hello. Thank you so much for being here, and I completely agree with you. My question for you is Are you still finding time to play bass guitar? No, no not really. I've got um, a lovely semi acoustic bass guitar now, and I took it out the other week actually, and I had a plonk on it for a couple of hours. But it's not something I do with a band anymore. But it is nice to just take it out, wouldn't it be in a semi-acoustic, just to play it naturally, you know. Um, it's, so I do a little bit, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it was up to concert standard at, at the minute. Well, were you in a band before? Oh, God, yeah, I've been in bands, yeah. I was in a band called, uh, the, well, I was in a street theatre called The Snacks. Then I was in a band called The Snackheads. That's how we got our equity cards. We joined up with some musicians because oh, you really? had a variety act. Uh, I was in a band called Dr. Freak's Padded Cell. We used to electrocute someone in a Guantanamo Bay suit as our own <laughs> intro. That was good. We had a car battery behind him and we spit sparks out of his head while he jumped about like he's being tortured in Guantanamo Bay. We were like heavily into uh, dance music and taking ease at gigs. That was something to do. Wow. Well, thank you. I'm a musician as well, so I'd like to hear your story and how you've combined both fields. Oh, well, uh, just a case of having to. I also played uh, bass a couple of times for The Fall, the band, because I know Mark, he, well, I used to know Mark, uh, rest his soul, and I I got a call, he'd sat the bass player, what are you doing tomorrow? Why, we need a bass player in Turkey. So I went to Turkey and on a Monday, played the gig with him on the Tuesday and came back on the Wednesday. And then I done a live in the Northwest, um, which is actually on YouTube, under the counter where Mark didn't get up out of the audience. So we've done an instrumental of it. Cantankerous old bastard, but I love him. Thank you. It's really fascinating. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm just going to mention something now that I was, and I'm sure people may have heard it, watched it, I should say. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful um, piece of prose, I think it would be, that you, that you gave us. Um, and it was a list of, 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 of monologues and things which um, Ian, I don't want to get your name wrong, Ian Donahue? Yeah, Ian. Was, yes, I mean, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm going to ask Ian if he will unmute himself and just tell us a little bit more and how you felt about what Steve did because I thought it was a very, very moving, very believable 
that piece that Steve um, did for us. That. Hello, um, Ian. Hello, how Ian. Do, how do you do, Philip? Hello, um, Well, I, I sent the monologue because I like Steve's stuff on Twitter because he's bananas, to be honest. He's been a breath of fresh air during lockdown. I sent him um, a little monologue and he got back in touch and I'd asked people to read them and this and that. He said, no, I'm going to learn it. And that kind of blew me away. I was so impressed. And he said, I'm learning this. And he says, I'm sat in my car. He says, and I'm, I'm crying. And I was, you know, when you write something, firstly, you don't think an actor, you know, like Steve's going to do something like that. And then to take his time and learn it. And then he's recorded it. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it, you can't believe that the words are ever on a page because it's just it just sounds like it's from the heart. It just sounds so raw in the way he delivers it. And as I say, two builders today in Nottingham, right, watched it with me and they were both crying. Wow. Right. That... You know, two, two blokes work, working away. And uh, I showed them. And loads, loads of my friends have watched it and just said, why? Well, like Reese Dinsdale came out on Twitter and he, ju he just thought it was... He thought it was fantastic, and like, and that's because it is. Like, it is so genuine. I, I, during lockdown, I've been paper boy to a guy, George, eighty years old up my street, and going, going to talk to George on a daily basis. And I showed it to George, and George had read the book, The Missing Piece, that I wrote, and he just went, "Wow!" He says, "How has that jumped off the page like that?" And he went, "He is, he is top draw." He is top draw. And he says, he says, I've seen him in loads of things, loads of things. I've brought. It, you know, but it was just an amazing piece of acting. Just astonishing. And, and the thing is, people think, people think that Steve's fun, a, a, funny, a, a funny actor. But the bottom line is, he's a bloody good actor. Yes. And he just happens to be funny. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, Ian, uh, first of all, I received the books you sent me today. Oh, bless you. I just got them today. Um, but what I will say about the piece you wrote, it was just very, very, very well written, I thought. And it was quite easy to learn because it was well written. And I knew I didn't want to read it out. I knew I didn't want to sit there with reading it off a page. I knew when I read it that I wanted to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted to deliver it. And I think that's how it should sound. It should sound as though nobody's written it. It should sound like a bloke who sat there not quite sure what he's going to say next and about his mum. It was a very, very moving piece. And uh, I, I'm just glad that you think that I did it justice. That makes me happy. Oh, well, I, well, and the question earlier about the improvisation and stuff, clearly, if you deliver something like that, it never looks like it was on a page. And I think that's the trick. And that's where Isn't great it? casting and everything comes in. You know, you know we, if you get the right people, to link link the right paper with the right script and then it just looks effortless so it's great i'll tell you what thank you very much and thanks for what you've done on twitter this lockdown because you you have seriously you just couldn't take your eyes off you and uh it's a, it's a good thing people people need you know people to to distract and you've certainly been a hell of a distraction so i raise my glass thank you very much well, that goes back to what i said before we are the jesters, the minstrels. We're in the entertainers. We're here to boost morale. We're here when the shit hits the fan. And we're here to make people laugh, enjoy, reflect, cry. All of them things we're here for, especially in times of trouble. Because the fuckwits in charge aren't doing much about it. So it's always down to the common man and woman. Yeah, I'll go with that. You know, I'll go with that. And let's face it, we've run out of telly. We've run out well, of telly there you now. Go, there you go. We've run out of <laughs> telly. They've used us up and threw us aside. We're here. This is what we're here for. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you very much and thank you for all this. So, thank talk, you. Bless thank your heart. You so much, Ian. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We're running out of time, sadly. Uh, but before we go, just uh, a couple of things. First of all, can we not twist Trevor's arm to come on and just say so a few words, please? Yeah. <laughs> come on, your old mates. Let's come on, see Trev. Trevor. Hey, mate. Hey, Steve. Hey, Hi, everyone. Well, okay. Kids loved you the other day. <laughs> you know, it's quite funny. Me and Steve have been mates for 
we have we're going for years and we're we similar age and our paths really I did the same thing. I went to Abraham Moss and Helen Parry is the mentor and you know she's the saint isn't she Steve of everything. And again yeah. for, the, for for to give in actors like us, you know, us working class actors, whatever you want labels, common actors, uh, a platform. And she's been in Ted that and like you say, yeah, she's just been fantastic. But um, it's quite funny, we, we are really good mates, but it's weird because Steve is the granddad that I've never had. Because <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you see Steve with his grandkids and he's talking about, I mean, I don't want to embarrass him, he knows what I think about him, I love him like a, like a brother. You know, he's my, he's my white brother from another mother, you know what I mean? And uh, we, um, when you see him as he is, you know, people say, oh, about actors, they're all up their own asses and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and we have the same, we have the same cliche about, you know, celebrities. No, we're not celebrities. Doctors and nurses are celebrities. People are trying to find cures for, for cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Them on the front line, they're celebrities. We're just lucky to be yeah. what we do and to do and, and be what we do. So when I see Steve with his grandkids, I never had a granddad. My granddad died when I was like 11, really, at the old big C. And, um, the other, the other granddad was eight thousand miles away in Jamaica. I've never seen. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So when I see Steve with his kids, <laughs> it's like he's the granddad that we all want. Do you know? Yeah, what you're I mean? not getting any spends. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Macy. You know what I mean? Which is his, his granddaughter, and I call him the lad who should be king. His grandson. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we were out at Berry Market on uh, the other night, and uh, they were playing shop. Cheeky bastards charged me a tenner for fishing chips. <laughs> I haven't trained well. But no, um, yeah, he, he is. He is a unique. He's a unique talent. Uh, I'm proud to be associated with him. Like I say, I said to me today exactly what you know. Everybody's reiterating here about uh, Twitter. Oh, he has. He has made it. He has made it. You know, funny and made lockdown a bit more. Ooh, a bit more easier. Yeah. To, to, to all aspects, uh, John, you know. Yeah, and I, I, I noticed a, a wonderful picture of you, like uh, kindred spirits almost, with your same face masks on. Can you tell us? Yeah, he's got me one. Have you, heard, have you read what, what he says on you? Because I couldn't really see. I didn't put Well, right that was going to be my question, you see. You know, you said about the Q&A. I was going to say to Steve, so, as an actor, you've worn many masks. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most prolific and superb mask you've ever worn? He got me a mask. He got me a mask last week, Trevor, and it's got little small words on it, and it says "cunt" on it. <laughs> That's what it says. He bought me that, Trevor. Yeah, right. Okay, I'll believe that. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. It's true. It's true. Because again, of you bought the, you bought Steve that mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah got the brassic thing. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, uh, that's brilliant. And are you both wearing them still? Yeah, you are. yeah. <laughs> because, as Steve will reiterate, if you can see what that word says, yeah. it means you're too close. Yes. Ah, there you go. That's brilliant. Thanks well, if anyone so complains, complains about, about it, it really thank you for, for, for sharing all of that. Cheers, yeah. Trev. Love you, mate. Love you. And you, Paul. Hey, guys, we're going to have to close. Um, remember to stay back after oh. if you want to. But will you all unmute for me now, please, and do one one very big thing. Put your left hand to your right and give a very, very big thank you to the, the one and only Steve Everts. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's been amazing. And I hope we, we're going to see more of you, definitely. So if you goodbye for now, and we will all speak very soon. Thank you.